So I'll be talking about airflow configuration options for scalability. So when you talk of airflow configuration, it is those options that can help you to customize airflow behavior to meet your needs. There are two different places that you can set airflow configuration. One is in airflow.cfg, and the other one is environment variables, which overrides the airflow CFG. And I'll talk about this more later. And we have different configuration areas, such as the core, scheduler, database executors, which is Celery, Kubernetes executor, and the rest of them. Why does configuration matter? When you properly configure your airflow, you can be sure that uh, you, you are making efficient use of your CPU, memory, I.O., and other resources. And it also enhances performance when you um, set things like parallelism and math type query and other options uh, to improve your task execution speed. It also supports scalability, which means if your data is increasing, if your uh, workload and everything you want to go higher, uh, your pipelines are becoming complex, configuring airflow properly will help you to really scale. So how do we set airflow configuration? When you start airflow initially, you get airflow CFG in the airflow home folder which contains a uh, default configuration that Airflow runs with. This default configuration it appears like this. You have the core session, you have different sessions, and those are the sessions, and you have the options. For example, here we have the DAX folder, which you can change, and you are now customizing it to really meet your needs. You also have the environment variables, which overrides this airflow CFG value, whatever you set in airflow CFG. If you set environment variables, it will override those settings you did in airflow CFG. And the way you do the airflow environment variable is that the session has to be in the middle and have two underscores, double underscores between airflow and the option you want to set. For example, here we are trying to change the DAX folder and the core session. At the course, the DAX folder is at the core session. So having airflow double underscore core, double underscore DAX folder, your value will override whatever setting you have in airflow CFG. Then if you are using airflow CFG, I will advise you to clear out all the content of the file and only set options that you want to keep that are different from the default. Because if you are just changing values in with the default, you have the defaults, you have the your own custom values, then you have issues when you start to troubleshoot. You don't know where you, you are making some mistake or where you have an option that is different from the default options. So today, like I said, we are just going to talk about configuration related performance, improving performance of airflow that's uh, configuration related. We're not going to talk about other things, just about the configuration options. And we're also not going to talk about the mass active runs per DAG, and mass active tasks per DAG, but these other options, I'm going to talk about them in more detail. So starting with its core parallelism. So this represents the maximum number of task instances that your airflow system can run per scheduler, and is also regardless of the worker count. So all your running and queue tax in Airflow is what core parallelism determines. If you set it as 32, then the total running and queue tax in your Airflow should be equal to that 32, and it will not be more than that. Also, the scheduler count, if you are using two schedulers, it affects the total parallelism that you are going to run, like the total number of task instances that you run in your airflow system. So if it is set as 32 and you have two schedulers, then 
your two two tax instances that can run in that system is sixty four. That is both running and queued task. We also have the concept of unlimited parallelism, and this is when you set parallelism to zero. Then Airflow will assume that yeah you want unlimited parallelism, and the time like this is more desirable when you when you are using Kubernetes executor and you don't know how Airflow is going to like you don't know the number of tasks instances your cluster can be able to run, so you want to give it to the cluster, leave it to the cluster to determine the number of task instances it can run. So, but I personally prefer that you have a value instead of just zero. It, maybe say you want to run 1,000 task instances. That will help you to really plan and check other configurations up to meet up with that parallelism that you set. And we have another option, mass TI per query which is the number of tax instances that the scheduler can examine for scheduling or queuing in each loop of the scheduler. So at every loop, it will get this maximum number of tax instances and check whether to schedule or queue them to the executor. Okay. There are several places that we use this master IP query. And we're going to just go through them so that we understand when we set the value what it actually does. The first place is we use it in scheduler to schedule task instances. So whatever, at every loop of the scheduler, it will try to schedule this mass TIP query number of task instances. Like it will get them, try to see if to put them to schedule or not. Now we have it in mini scheduler, which is schedule, schedule after task execution. So when your task has finished running, we'll still talk about it. But yeah, we use it here to determine the number of task instances we can set, send to schedule state. Then we also use it to send task instances to the executor. Now, parallelism and master IP query work hands in hand. So if you are setting parallelism, you also need to check the value for master IP query because if you are setting one and you are not updating mass TIP query, you might not see the expected uh, performance you want. So if you are using one scheduler and your parallelism is 32, you can actually leave Airflow at, at the default 16. But remember that this mass TIP query is the number of task instances the scheduler will try to put to schedule or queued in every loop. So every loop of the scheduler, if the parallelism is 32, at every loop, it will try to examine 16 task instances to send them to queued or scheduled. But when you're using one scheduler, you will not notice any difference. But sorry, when you are using one scheduler and the parallelism is 32 and you have the it as 16, you will not notice much uh, difference. But when the parallelism is 200, and you leave it at the default of um, 16, you notice a performance degradation. So the way to calculate the value that you can set this master IP query is to check that if the value is 200 and you're using one scheduler, let it be lower than that mass um, that parallelism, you can set it at 150. But if you, are, if you have two schedulers, they need to increase this value to 250 to 300. Because having two scheduler means that your parallelism is like 400. So you need to increase this, put it between 250 or 300. So there's also some issues that you encounter if you have a high value for this master IP query. If the value is very high, it will take time for the scheduler loop to go through, which means that the heartbeat will not come on will not come up on time. So we need to take this into account before setting the value. Also, if you set it to a very big value, you can also have the, the query predicate become too complex and also have excessive locking, which would impact your database. Then we also have this pool stuff. Like it's, even if you set your parallelism to 200 and you have 
uh, you are using the default pool, which is 128, which has a 128 task slot, it will limit the number of task instances that can be running in your executor. So you'll be seeing at most 128 task instances running or queued. So you need to increase this value if you want to run more than 128 task instances. But when you already have a, an existing deployment and you plan on changing the configuration of the default pool, it won't work. So you have to do it through the UI, CLI, or the REST API. Otherwise, it will not work. You can also create your own pools to limit resources, to limit the number of task instances you run in your Airflow executor. So another configuration is mini scheduler, which is scheduled after task execution. This helps the scheduler to kind of schedule downstream task instances of a task that has just finished running. It helps you to schedule it fast. Uh, instead of the scheduler taking the decision, the mini scheduler will try and schedule those task instances. So, and it also has some disadvantage, but yeah, it, it actually helps scheduler, but it has this advantage that your, the DAG that you started will execute fast in expense of other DAGs. So you need to keep that in mind. So to set it to, to use it, you have to set it to true, or if you don't want to use it, you set it to false. Um, before we go further, let's just talk about some important things that the scheduler loop does. So one of the things that the scheduler loop does is that it kind of locks down objects before working on them. This is because of HA, so that one scheduler will work on this particular object and the other scheduler cannot work on it. So it tries to lock queries with select for updates. It locks that model to create that runs and locks that run to examine the dark run, also put the task instances to scheduled or put it to queued. Then it also locks task instances before sending them to executors. So the reason for this is so that there is no conflict between two schedulers. So keep this in mind as we go over to the next one. The schedule also runs some timed events at regular intervals. So this is also important and we'll talk about it more. Let's now talk about the scheduler HA, which means running multiple schedulers. When you are running more, multiple schedulers, this use rule level locking. You must set it to true, unless you don't want to run multiple schedulers. Well, this should be true because the scheduler looks, uses it to lock pools, DAGs, DAG runs to really work on them. So make sure to set it to true, which is the default. And you have mass DAG run to creep a loop. This setting is what determines the number of DAGs that can be locked to create DAG runs. So if you have two schedulers, you can keep this value low so that you can distribute work between the schedulers. The same thing applies to mass DAG runs per loop to schedule. So you, if you keep it low, anytime the scheduler loop is running, it will take this number of DAG runs, lock them, try to schedule task instances in the DAG run, and also send them the task instances to queue. Now, there are also some timed events in the scheduler which are at the default value to kind of delay the scheduler loops. One of them is often task check interval. This setting checks if there is any dead scheduler so that the task instances of that scheduler can be adopted and another scheduler can adopt the task instances and complete them. What's happening is that once, if a scheduler is dead, the task instances will still be in running state. So there is no harm in not detecting this change immediately. You can allow it for some time so that the scheduler loop will be free a little bit and yeah, when it runs, it will try to adopt those task instances. Another thing is trigger timeout check interval. This configuration also 
is not useful unless you are using triggers. And I think it runs every five minutes or so. So you should make sure that you set this to a very high value if you are not using triggers. Then pull matrix interval. If you are using stars D, I advise that you set this to match the stars D rule of period because it also runs some queries at regular intervals in the scheduler loop. Then you also have this passing cleanup interval. So if you bake your DAG in the image, you don't need to set this to a low value. Or if you are not using data sets, you don't need to set, leave this configuration the way it is. You have to increase it very high so that it doesn't stop your cellular loop. So let's talk about DAG passing. So in DAG passing, if you are not if you are not changing DAG every every now and then, if you are not adding new DAGs, there's no need, no need to have this at five minutes. You can clear it very high. And if your DAG is baked, baked in the image, try to set it this, set it very high. And you also have this setting that also, if you have it as low value, it kind of increases the CPU usage. And what this does is that it's try to check if you made some changes in your DAG so that it can pick it off. So if you have enough CPU, you can leave it. But if you bake your darkening image, there's no need to set this um, low. We also have the five passing sort mode. And if you are using HA, random CD by host is preferred. And if you're not using, if you're using standalone that processor, you can use modified time. Then you have passing processes. You can have as many passing processes depending on your CPU count. If you have enough CPU, you can increase your passing processes. So yeah, thank you.